All right, back in studio, back with the guest list. It's been a few episodes um, from the Crypto Natives, and now I finally get to sit here with my good friend, Dennis Yu. We've been uh, trying to do this now for a few months. This man <laughs> is busy traveling across the world. He's done over 700 live keynotes across 17 countries. He has his own show called the, the Coach Yu Show. He is CEO of Blitz Metrics, also the, the CTO of... Cairo Revenue. I'm sure there's probably a million of other things that this yeah. man is diving into, which um, we can talk as well. He has been, he's worked for company leadership positions in Yahoo and American Airlines and has spent over $1 billion in Facebook ads from the various companies that, and ad and uh, marketing strategies that we've gone across. So Dennis, thank you for coming here. Awesome, Jake. Always good to see you. Yeah, right. How, how funny is the world and this creator economy that we're going to? Um, first time we met was when you were actually doing a keynote at Mandalay Bay, which was oh, that's what, right. maybe four months ago, that five months Brad ago Lee, right? with Brad Lee. Yeah, yeah, that was like maybe springtime. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just so enamored with the way that you had the co command of the stage <laughs> standing in front. And you're literally talking about how to have proper... Um, charismatic skills when you're standing on stage and now we're sitting here across from each other. What a, what a, what a weird world we're moving into. It's wild. We're connecting even deeper though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the, the world's becoming integrated, um, in many different ways. Um, I know you are a very forward thinking person. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, as I mentioned before, you've spent over a billion dollars in Facebook ads. Uh, Mark is now pivoting Facebook to become Meta. <laughs> what what type of ad revenue comes into a metaverse? How do you how do you channel something like that? So Mark wants to control all your data, <laughs> so that's why Meta is Facebook and all these other properties. And when you're in a virtual environment, you can buy virtual goods and buy real goods. So this is their play into trying to own e-commerce. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, are you a believer in the things that he's trying to do? Do you think no. this metaverse is going to be a massive trend? Do you think this um, upends the, the Facebook ad model? Facebook's in trouble. So they had to change their name among many things. But the idea of the metaverse, like Neil Stevenson put out there in Snow Crash, will happen. But I don't think it's going to be Facebook's version of the metaverse. Now, Facebook's trying to intentionally confuse the words. So when we're, like you and I, we're friends on Facebook. But then the question is, are we actually friends? So if you're in the metaverse, are you in Facebook's metaverse or the actual metaverse? And the idea of living in a decentralized world, which is, you know, crypto or other platforms that allow people to be able to coexist is not what Big Brother wants. So I don't think Facebook's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's gilded jail is not going to be where I'm going to spend my time. Yeah, absolutely. We're not, we're definitely not. And speaking of like crypto and this like Web3 environment, mm -hmm. it also kind of um, completely takes the, the current ad the ad model, right, mm -hmm. of ad pay for advertisement, and now changes it because it's put on to the, the community. Um, have you thought about this idea and how um, market spend is going to change over the next, we'll say, decade? Well, ultimately, with things like NFTs or being able to support an influencer or like a Patreon, everything's become personal and more granular. So it used to be a brand was like a major TV station. Now all of us are brands, but the infrastructure to track the value of a brand, the value of your personal brand, the number of people who have been on the guest list podcast, the number of friends that we have in common, the number of people that buy because we make a recommendation, we're almost at the verge of being able to do that. And that's going to create this massive affiliate economy where like, let's say that you mentioned a restaurant that maybe we go to later, and because someone heard that and then they went to that restaurant, you should get a tiny little piece of that transaction. So there's too much friction right now for that to happen, but we're probably just a couple of years away from that. And I don't think it's the metaverse or crypto. I think it's the fact that everything's being tied together. The question is, who owns that data and where is that centralized identity going to come from? Yeah, that's that's a scary model. As um, somebody who's been in the crypto world for for a while, that that has a complete spectrum of libertarians to cypherpunks yep. to people who just don't care at all and they just want fast transactions and more of yep. like a permissionless manner. 
it's a, it's a very fun. And I love that we get to start on the forward thinking aspect of the show, mm -hmm. but let's, let's backtrack it a little bit. Um, and for those who, who are not familiar with the, with the infamous Dennis, you tell us, tell, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, about your, your upbringing, um, your mentality growing up and kind of how it's changed to where you are today. Well, Jake, I think infamous is probably the right word. <laughs> I was on CNN live in front of three and a half million people globally talking about Cambridge Analytica and should Facebook be regulated? And I said, yes, they're like cigarettes. And they brought on Mark Zuckerberg. And Mark Zuckerberg and I had an argument, as we've had before. So people will say things like, well, have you met Mark Zuckerberg? Or does Mark Zuckerberg know you? Mark Zuckerberg hates me. <laughs> <laughs> and now he should love me because I've spent a billion dollars across all of our clients on Facebook ads, which have translated into making him one of the richest people on the planet. But I've had, I've, I'm kind of known for doing things that are a little mischievous right? Not anything that's bad or criminal, but I want to push the edge. So today with some of my friends, I recorded some of the, well, I took some of the episodes that they have, their podcast episodes or YouTube videos, because I can Google anybody. You can Google anybody and pull down their YouTube videos. And then I ran it through Descript, which is one of my favorite tools. A lot of podcasters use that. They have a feature called Overdub. And I was able to deep fake the audio where I had myself saying words I never said. And then I ran it through this other tool called Synthesia, which will put those, will make your, your lips move according to the words that are being said. And then I use Jarvis, which is an AI writing tool that will write words, write copy, write blog posts, write books on any topic that you want, right? And I can say in the voice of Jake Gallen, from, or 10 reasons why Las Vegas is going to be the tech center in 2022 for crypto. And it'll write a whole article, right? So I combine those three today to show people what's possible. And Someone like me is going to think this way because I'm a systems-minded engineer. I built the analytics at Yahoo 20-some years ago. So I'm a search engine engineer. I've always felt that there's data behind everything that we do. The question is, where is that data going and how is it being used to improve our lives? Advertising, I think, can be a really good thing. When Zuckerberg and I first had one of our big arguments back in 2007, 2008, we had lunch. We had hamburgers. And he told me that I needed to shut down the ad ecosystem that I built. So... You probably remember when F8, the whole Facebook ecosystem launched and people were, were building apps. So mm. there, and you know, food fight happy. I think people were throwing, you know, the zombies, werewolves, wolves, ninja, you know, Farmville. A lot of the ads in there were powered by my ad platform. So those ads on who has a crush on you and what's your IQ were run through my ad server. So I was doing $85,000 a day running ads. Wow. But it wasn't, it, they weren't my ads. They, I was a platform that allowed advertisers and publishers to get together. So I've served billions of ads through ad systems that I've built or ad systems that we use, like running ads on Google and Facebook. So my career has been built on collecting information and trying to create personalized experiences that are based on that. Yeah, and through through your, your platform, were you the one that was housing the information or was it sent back to, to Facebook because it was running through their platform? I can probably tell you that today. <laughs> and in my entire career, I've never answered that question directly because it's against the terms of service to ever collect the data. They had something called a 24 hour rule. So <clears throat> all these Facebook developers or people that were developing apps and you can develop apps anywhere on, you know, develop on Amazon or you know, iPhone apps or whatnot, but they're not supposed to be able to keep that user data. So if somebody uninstalls your app, they're supposed to delete the data, but is there any way to know whether they actually did that or not? There's not. So I built a platform that allowed developers to be able to give us their users data of all the people using that app. And then we would create ads that would have your face and Mark's face and other people's face in them and show names and all this kind of stuff. We were the first, I believe in the world to create personalized ads that actually were made with your friends information in them. So we had access to the data to be able to do that. So, so is this all of your, your wrongdoing where when I go onto some sort of web page on the right hand side, dogs are coming up because I was talking about dogs or, um, on the, the left hand side, there's a pop-up that happens and it starts showing the Denver Broncos just because I've been to the Denver Broncos webpage the yeah. last two days. So I'm one of those people. I'm not the only one, but I'm, I'm one of these guilty people that's trying to serve ads that we believe will be relevant to you. 
but it doesn't have to be like a lot of people say, oh, I was at lunch with a friend and they talked about this one product and I've never heard about it before. And I saw an ad for it right away. It couldn't have been a coincidence. Facebook was listening on my phone, maybe, but it could be simply that we, we know, and I've done this test. We've done analysis for the federal trade commission because I was called in to testify and all this kind of stuff. And we showed that people are actually very similar. So if, if we look at your favorite kinds, your preferences in terms of the kind of food you like or the music you listen to, the odds are your friends also have those same preferences. So if we know what any one person in the group likes to do, we can show the same ads to everyone else in that group. Now, we live in a multicultural society accepting people of all different kinds of walks in life. And so people say that. But if you look at what's called the filter bubble, you've heard of the filter bubble? I'm not familiar with the term. Okay, so let's say... We take all the people who love Donald Trump, you know, and they're all over here. Let's say they're conservative and all the liberal people over here and whatever it is, you'll see that there's not, you'll, you'll see big cloud, this big cloud of blue and this big cloud of red. And there's not many people that go in between. There's not many purple people because people like to clump together and it creates an echo chamber because people want to be around other people that reinforce that same belief. Now, what does the social network do? It intensifies that because What's ever in your news feed is going to be things. If you, if you click on Donald Trump or you talk about crypto stuff, you're going to see way more crypto stuff. TikTok is the latest incarnation of that because whatever you click on, you're going to get way more of that. So what it does is whatever niche you're into, whatever interest you have, it intensifies that niche. So the algorithm, not because it's evil, but it wants to show you, th it wants to further, like if you have some weird eccentric thing, it's going to try to amplify that. And so what that does is it creates further and further segregation because it becomes an us versus them because it polarizes anything. It polarizes groups and it brings them together. It's not because Facebook is evil and they're trying to you know, put out conspiracy theories. It's because the nature of a social media algorithm does that. So knowing all of this information and mentioning in the beginning that Facebook is obviously they, they have the data and they're, they're merging to, to meta to change the narrative. Um, would you spend your ad dollars on a different platform? And if not, and you're st still continuing to, to advertise on Facebook after mm -hmm. what you said, uh, what is the reason why? I wouldn't leave Facebook just because there's all this nonsense that's happening. We see people have lost maybe 20%, 30% of their conversions because of the Apple iOS 14 thing. But Facebook's still the number one platform to advertise on for social media. So Google's had a lot of problems too. Microsoft's had a lot of problems over the last 15, 20 years. But do you see people leaving Google? Do you see people saying, because you know, Microsoft had a monopoly on the operating system and on things like Windows and Microsoft Office, but you didn't see people leaving them. Or you see people complaining about United Airlines because something bad happens. You don't see people leaving United Airlines. So I don't think Facebook really has lost much efficacy in every six months someone will say, oh, we need to all leave Facebook or all the teens are leaving Facebook because they're going to Snapchat or whatnot. People say that, but I don't think people are really leaving Facebook. There's going to be no new social networks, but from a business standpoint, I'm going to invest proportionately to where the audiences are and the audiences are largely, and of course, every business, every industry is different, but it's largely going to be in Facebook, Google, and which includes YouTube and TikTok. And TikTok's the fastest growing social network by far. Yeah, it scaled to a three billion or one billion users in th about three years after founded, which I think is probably the yeah. fastest I've ever seen from yep. a social media platform. And they have the highest session time of any social media network by far. Is that from opening the app to closing the app out? Yeah, the amount of time you spend in the app. Wow. That is, that because is... their algorithm is addictive. They have the most addictive algorithm. So I don't ever open it. <laughs> Yeah. And a lot of friends are like, oh, I'm just going to experiment. I'm like, okay, come back to me in a week and tell me how much time you spent on TikTok. So, so knowing all of this then, um, what is the, the most effective way for the average individual? Let's say somebody who is listening to this podcast and mm -hmm. I'm not calling all of you guys average, but, um, if you're listening here, maybe, um, you're probably not, um, in the upper echelon maybe, but, um, how, how do you, um, what's the best way to get the best bang for your buck, so to speak on Facebook? Think of Facebook as an amplifier. Think of it as this black box. And whatever you stick inside the black box, close the lid, press the button, you get 10 times more out of whatever that is. So let's say I take a dollar bill and I put it in the box and I press the button, I'm gonna get 10 $1 bills coming out. So we see people where they'll say, you know, I tried Facebook ads and it didn't work. Or all this nonsense controversy about Facebook or whatnot. And I'll say, who cares about that? That's noise. What are you trying to amplify? What exactly are you trying to sell? Is there a landing page? Is there a place I can go to buy that particular product or service? If you're super clear about that 
and you load it up into Facebook and you set up what we call digital plumbing, which is the pixels and the tracking and integrating your email and all that, then Facebook ads will work. They work super well. As long as you're not in a category that, you know, it's like medical marijuana or CBD or, or, all, or all these other, like pills or things that, that are difficult to talk about, but where there's some kind of social proof where you have happy customers that are talking about what you're doing, you already have a business that's generating sales and customers, Facebook is a very, very good place to do that. It is still the number one place to amplify social proof. And that's what drives sales on Facebook. If you put in your testimonials, you put in what customers are saying about products that you have, the system now does the optimizing. The system does the targeting. Yesterday, Facebook announced that they're removing most of interest all the cool kinds of interest targets we used to be able to do, they've been killing it off the last couple of years. Now they've announced they're going to pretty much kill all of it. Ad prices have gone way up. The average CPM is about $20. It used to be $8 two years ago, and it's $2 maybe um, seven years ago. So there's a lot of things that people are complaining about, but the algorithm has gotten smarter. And thus, here's the key point for anyone here listening to this podcast. If you are driving sales of something, trackable sales, could be through Shopify, could be through some lead form, it could be, you know, track something that's tracked ideally in, in Google Analytics where there's a conversion that fires, Facebook will get you more of that. Uh, remarketing, you understand how remarketing works where the, the pixels follow you all over the internet. That's there and lookalike audiences will work. So if you have at least 200 customers that have bought your product and you feed that into Facebook, Facebook will find other people that are just like those people. And it's like magic, you don't need to hire a consultant you don't need to talk to someone like me. It's like magic. You literally just have to put it in the machine, press the button, and it works. And let's say you decide to um, put it, we're going to put in $100 to put into um, the, the ad generation on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I'm not necessarily selling a product, but maybe I'm trying to sell my brand or some sort of service. Does that still have the same impact as, as it's a little bit of a different... Um, selling point than a product or a tangible well, item? Well, yes or no. I mean, with a product, like something on Shopify or e-commerce where clearly there's a checkout, someone puts in a credit card, that's easier. Usually that's going to be lower ticket, like under $100. But if you're selling professional services, let's say that you are a cosmetic surgeon or you're a real estate agent, right? That's not a you know one-click Amazon checkout kind of thing. That requires a relationship or you're selling B2B or you have a SaaS platform or something that requires consultation then Facebook actually works better for that than it does on e-com. And the reason why is that people who've built a personal brand out of reputation because they're known in a particular niche, because they're, they have happy clients that will talk about what they've done, as long as you can track that, that sale or that lead or someone filling out a form or watching a webinar or downloading your lead magnet or what, whatever that event is that shows interest that's trackable, as long as you can track that event, Facebook is fantastically good at driving more conversions against that. And even if you're spending $2 a day or $10, we have this, our most popular course is called the dollar a day course, which is on how do you take social proof, put it into the system, press the button, and it will generate more of that. So there's, there's nothing better than Facebook. I can't imagine in the next 10 years, there's going to be a platform that's better than Facebook, even in 2030, than Facebook to do this. Is there a metric for the the quality of um, how, how do I describe this? Is there is there a metric for the the quality of users that are clicking on your ad per se? Yeah. Um, Facebook oftentimes gets chastised for creating this rivalrous war, right, right, yeah. left, black, white, whatever, right. whatever it is. Does Facebook track that in any way, or is it just every person is one click, they're a number, and that's it? They absolutely calculate a score. And I've flown to Facebook multiple times and had discussions with engineers to try to validate some of the theories that I have based on the data that we have. By the way, when that Cambridge Analytica thing happened, remember how that company got in trouble for supposedly taking all this data, 50 million users, and then using it to manipulate the election or whatnot? We had 100 times more data than that company ever did. We had more data than pretty much anybody. And we never got in trouble for that because... How was I saying? What was the question? You had lost track of the question. Uh, the, if there's a scoring metric for oh, yeah, the, yeah, the, the scoring, people. The scoring. So when <clears throat> I've had multiple conversations with engineers at Facebook and they used to release what's called a relevant score. Let me step back a minute because I think this is for those of us that are geeky and mechanical and want to understand like how the, the system works. I'm going to give you a little shop talk that I think will be worthwhile because it under it's it's really the 
the underlying algorithm that powers all social networks. So Google had something that was called a quality score, and that's been around for 20 years. And quality score in ads is looking at whether people will buy that particular product because there's people that are advertising and there's publishers that are getting paid for the inventory they have on their website. And the qualities, if you had a better quality score based on better engagement, better click-through rate, higher purchase conversions, then Google would give you a discount. So it's on a one to 10 scale. And if I ran ads and my quality scores were five and Jake, you ran ads and your quality scores were 10, then all else equal, because your quality scores were twice as high as mine, you'd only pay half as much for your ads. So then, and this is still true today. So if you're advertising on Google and you get a better quality score, you're gonna pay way, way less. And so it penalizes people that suck at advertising. And why would Google do that? Because if people have a bad experience, they're not gonna use Google as often. And if those recommendations that happen to be paid for through ads are good, people will continue to use Google. So that's where the paid and the organic side work together on Google. Now Facebook comes in and they're using the same algorithm. They call it a, qual or instead of quality score, they call it a relevant score. So what's going on? There's a news feed on Facebook. People are scrolling through it. There's things that are happening organically based on what Facebook thinks you're most likely to engage with based on three key factors, who your friends are, what your friends have done, and what you've clicked on, right? And that's that. And TikTok is the worst of all these because they don't even care what your friends are doing. They're just showing what's the most unashamedly, most viral, ridiculous stuff to click on, right? So they can show the most viral content. They're not, con Facebook is constrained by pages that you follow or people that you're friends with. They're not just gonna show you all this other stuff on the internet. That's why TikTok is way more addictive because they don't have that constraint. So what's the number one thing in social? It's engagement, dwell time. So dwell time is how much people spend in that session or how long they watch that video for or whether they click back and they wanna watch it again, which is a huge signal to the algorithm saying, oh, Jake really likes this particular video. He's watched it three times. He's paused at this one particular point to see this one thing in slow-mo or whatever it is, right? Kind of like what porn companies pioneered 10 years ago to see what people <laughs> like, you know? So they're looking at engagement. Why? Because the higher the engagement rate, the more people will stay around. So in Facebook advertising, when you run ads, they're applying a relevance score. So if you have a higher engagement rate on your ads, if my ads are twice as engaging as your ads, I'm gonna pay half as much for that traffic, right? And so Facebook's, they actually, they still do provide some metrics. They used to give us the actual relevance score, one to 10. Now they give us these rele relevance factors, such as the click-through rate, the landing page quality, and the conversion quality. In other words, are people engaging with the ad itself? When people come to the website to buy or whatever, is the website loading slow? Are people sticking around? Or are people going right back to the news feed, which is a sign they didn't get what they want, right? And generally, is the content relevant to, to that particular user? And if those, those are true, then they're going to reward you with super cheap traffic. Why? Because that they want to create a, and so when Zuckerberg says, oh, I built this platform because I want to create a really good experience and I believe in helping the world, like he actually does believe that because the algorithm really is based on what drives the highest engagement. So if you want to build your personal brand, you have to be very clear about what is it that you want to get people to do, who exactly your, your tribe is, and the intersection between that is called relevance. The intersection between content and targeting is called relevance. So if I know that my, my crew is, you know, the crypto community and these folks that are native. You already know who these people are. You're interviewing them. So the, the, the network density is super high because anyone who knows you likely knows, you know, our buddy Josh Frazier and Josh Frazier probably knows Alex Berman who knows this person. Like it's a, it's a super tightly dense network. And thus the, the Venn diagram overlap between people who are fans of Jake Gallen versus people who are fans of whoever is going to be super high. That creates high engagement the network can see how many people have friends in common between these different groups, and they're gonna reward you for that, the more niche you are. And that's, that's how advertising works too, right? So if you want to amplify your personal brand, you wanna get more people knowing about you, or more people you know, downloading the podcast, or more people watching you on YouTube, you can do that by just letting the algorithm do, do what it does, but you have to be super clear on who that audience is and produce consistent content. That's why you hear all these people say, oh yeah, make sure you know, you're know you consistent with publishing content. It's because you're trying to train the algorithm to find those other users for you. But that's just investing money building your personal brand. If you're a services business, real estate, mortgage, chiropractor, whatnot, the same thing applies except you're monetizing through selling like a care plan or by drilling people's teeth or whatnot. 
you have to figure out how that works. So if I'm a Las Vegas chiropractor, I need to interview all my friends that are that have you know bad backs or who are, who are clients of mine. I need to interview the the girl who runs the local coffee place or you know we're here in the arts district. I need to say this is my favorite restaurant because I want to send a signal to Facebook and to Google that this is who I am. This is who my ideal customer is. I need to keep feeding them that signal and the algorithm will give me more of whatever I put in. Wow, it's almost like a like an invasion of privacy in a sense when, from all of this the analytics that they can tie to you and almost guess the the um, reaction to the content that you see and then the responses that you're going to have. Yeah. There's one platform that you didn't mention this entire time, which made me curious because it's oftentimes considered the most effective platform and it's, and it's Instagram, right? <laughs> um, why, why, why did you not, um, acknowledge this platform? It is owned by Facebook, but from a lot of the, um, stats that I see, mm -hmm. um, seven out of 10 people prefer Instagram over any other social media platform. So, um, why was the, why was this platform omitted? Because I just assume that Instagram is Facebook in the same way that YouTube is Google. There are a couple key differences. The reason why I consider it the same is that I'm coming at it from a business standpoint. I wanna drive sales. So if I wanna drive sales and leads, it doesn't matter if it's products or services or small biz or big businesses, I need to be able to collect data, be able to promote key assets, track conversions against those, you know, track leads and phone calls and all that. And Instagram, day one, when Kevin Systrom sold that to Zuckerberg for whatever, 1.6 billion, day one, the hooks to integrate Instagram into Facebook were already there. Zuckerberg lied and said, oh no, we're going to keep it separate. We're never going to integrate the two. If you're on Instagram, you're not automatically a Facebook user or whatnot. But the day of the acquisition, the code was already there. I saw that. And it's true to this day because there's something called Facebook Business Manager, which allows you to track all of your assets and your ad accounts and pixels and access to different things. And Instagram is treated as one property inside the Facebook ecosystem, just like Messenger, just like WhatsApp and all these other ones. So you could say like, hey, do you like to drink beer? Like, do you not like to, you know, why are you talking about Budweiser, but you're not talking about this micro brew? Because it's all Budweiser from a business standpoint, right? You, you understand like- Yeah, I, it's I was umbrella. A, I was with a friend yesterday in LA and he mentioned a micro brew that he liked. And because he, you know, he likes to micro brew because he doesn't want to support Budweiser. And I said- you know who actually manufactures that micro brew? It's Budweiser. <laughs> <laughs> and the kids don't know, right? The younger adults are all on Instagram. And so Facebook is doing the rebranding thing because they don't want everyone to know it's actually Facebook that owns all this stuff. Just like, do you like Trader Joe's? I do love Trader Joe's. Do you know who owns Trader Joe's? Oh God, you're probably going to ruin the experience Should for I me. Should I not tell you? Because <laughs> I love Trader is it, Joe's. Is it like Kroger or somebody? It's Aldi, which is the Walmart of Europe. Oh God. <laughs> That's why we shop at Sprouts out here in Las Vegas, I guess, until I find out that Kellogg's owns it and then it's game over. <laughs> so ultimately it's branding. It is. And, and you this have, is, you have it's one database. Instagram's all part of that. It's one big database. That's just the thing to know. Yeah. And you, ha and you have such a, a fundamental understanding of digital marketing, advertising and, and branding. And it's even taken you into the, the social media management side of it. Yeah. And so you formed your own business, yeah. correct? Right. Yeah. And it's uh, blitz metrics. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us a little bit about how that different differentiates itself from your experience from channeling a billion mm -hmm. dollars through Facebook? Well, I want other people to succeed as entrepreneurs, but I couldn't credibly, honestly do that unless I demonstrated a path of doing something first so that other people can follow. So if I wanna teach other people, if, if I want to help other agencies succeed, help other people be marketing consultants, or help young adults be able to be video influencers or whatever, then I need to be able to do that thing myself, right? If I'm gonna give you advice on how you need to be a better runner, then I should have already been a runner. I should already, like, I have to be able to practice what I preach. So I started an agency and we had awesome clients like Nike and Red Bull and the Golden State Warriors and Starbucks and stuff like that to demonstrate that we know what it takes to be able to build an agency and be able to make money doing that. And we have a program for young adults that want to be influencers, that want to learn how to use video, that want to grow their YouTube channel, that want to do drop shipping through Shopify or whatever. And so we partnered with the other Jake, Jake Paul, right? So you saw Jake Paul and I have this thing and you get, you know, by the time you see this or hear this, maybe it's launched or maybe not, because we promised we do it by the beginning of, of 2022, where 
Jake, who's the ultimate influencer for young adults, says, hey, Dennis and I created this program to help you be able to grow your social media following and be able to make money because school isn't what it used to be. So we had this idea of blitz metrics is nothing more than a holding company or the idea that let's amplify all these other people that are doing great things. So you're doing great things with your podcast. You want to be able to expand, not just you know in Vegas, but all these other entrepreneurs that are growing their businesses, not just through crypto, but in general, right? From your background, you know, doing this guest list stuff and the club scene and all that to being an entrepreneur, being super networked, that's awesome. Think about how many people could learn from your path there, from all the people that you know. Or we take Jake Paul, who started by learning how to do video. And now he's built it into this other business that does e-commerce or, you know, Fanjoy does a hundred million dollars a year in branded stuff for influencers. He built that company because he found there is, there was not a place that had good branded stuff for influencers or the boxing thing, right? And we want other people to be able to learn from people who have done that very thing in a recipe like way. My life's mission is to create a million jobs. And I want those million jobs to be because people got certified. They got a real education in an apprentice-like way where they're learning and earning at the same time. They're not just going to school and reading a book about something and turning in a paper. But if you want to learn how to do or build websites, for example, then you're going to be an apprentice and study from someone who's built lots of websites and is actively building websites. So you can build websites as a junior person and learn that thing so that by the time you graduate, you can do that on your own. If you want to be a doctor, right? You have to be an intern. You have to be a resident where you're working on, you know, cadavers initially, and then you're following around these other senior doctors and you do that for seven years or so. And then you become a real doctor working in a hospital. You want to be a pilot? You're not just going to do Microsoft flight simulator and fly a plane the next day. You're going to actually go through a real rigorous training program where you actually fly real planes with other pilots and they're watching you to make sure you don't crash. Right. And I think the same should be true in marketing and in digital marketing. But I ask you, is there such a program like they have for attorneys or doctors or people, you know, accountants, or there's a certification in all these other sorts of areas. Why isn't there such a program or an apprentice kind of program where you can learn how to do digital marketing and actually get real experience at the same time? Why doesn't that exist? It's because the way that society is evolving, especially the way that, that marketing's evolved over time. Um, as automation um, comes into play and takes some of these traditional jobs out, um, a lot of entrepreneurs or people that are tapped in the creator economy, you have to personalize it. You have to add a creative aspect to whatever you're doing because marketing has an umbrella, right? There's guerrilla marketing, there's yeah. digital marketing, influencer marketing. Influencer marketing wasn't a thing 15 years ago, the only influencers that exist were like rock stars and TV stars. Right. But now you have influencers who build a brand off of, off of almost anything off of like BDSM people. And I had a woman on here who had left, who lived at bunny ranch uh -huh. for three weeks and now has like a, now she's a massive influencer just off of that one experience. So you're almost like yeah. a experience. It's like experience marketing. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming over those, million jobs that you want to create, a lot of those marketers are going to find some, themselves in some sort of marketing pocket that probably doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Marketing is anything that drives deeper connection with people. I was just talking on the phone an hour ago with my buddy, Jonathan Pantalis, who has an incredible story about how his house burned down and he, you know, was rented this place and he started, he was, you know, he was interested in food. So he started a chocolate he started making chocolates. Now he's got a chocolate factory in San Francisco and he's scaling like crazy, right? And you would never have thought that that little micro niche of chocolates that don't have sugar because it's flavored with monk fruit and they also have adaptogens like ashwagandha and Reiki mushrooms, like people who care about that and want to be keto, like he's, he's starting to dominate that niche. You know, in the same way like Andy Frisella has 75 hard and all these guys who are sponsored, I see a lot of people who have a great story and they've turned it into a product or some kind of program. And there's so many different angles of marketing. Yet what I see common across all these entrepreneurs that we hang out with, which is really cool, it's a blessing, is that they all have a cool story. And when they put that story out there, they believe in that story so much, so passionately because they, they believe in service. They want to help other people. Like Jonathan wants to help other people who are dealing with stress because you're just one nutrient away. You know, it could be you're, you're carrying so much stress and you didn't realize that you needed just a couple nutrients because you're just eating garbage and you didn't know any better. He wants to help millions of people. But for him to be able to do that, 
he's got to make a lot of money to be able to reinvest in these programs, which means he also has to hire a lot of marketing people, a lot of virtual assistants for $500 a month, editing videos and posting on Instagram and Facebook and tuning ads and doing reports and running what we call the content factory. So as we see entrepreneurs grow, then they start to hire more people because they have to, to be able to manage all the different marketing channels. Now they have a YouTube channel. Now they have to do the stuff with the website. Now they're launching. This guy next week is launching a new product called Cacao Calm and it's hot chocolate. You just mix it in. I've tried it. It's delicious and it calms you because of the adaptogens that are in there. How ridiculous is that? We want more people who are entrepreneurs to lead stress-free lives because of just simple things like that. It's not because they're bad or they're somehow inferior. It's because they're, they're just not getting the right nutrients in their body. So him telling his story creates jobs because we need to get his message out there. He didn't realize that he can hire someone from the Philippines to work for him full time for $500 to edit videos. And this was stuff that he was doing all by himself. Our friend Colin Wayne Ehrman, he started Redline Steel. He's in you know the, the cover of Men's Fitness and Muscle Magazines and all that. He literally looks like one of those people, right? And he was injured in the line of duty, uh, disability, supposedly was never gonna walk again. And now he's got a 120,000 square foot factory. He's the largest manufacturer of home decor items in the United States. Super successful. He's spending several million dollars a month on Facebook ads. I coach him. His business is skyrocketing. He's looking for investment, but he's doing it by telling a story. But when I first met him a couple of years ago, he was doing his marketing all by himself. He was running his ads all by himself, but now he's hired a team of people. He's hired someone managing growth. He's hired VAs to be able to collect content from all of his customers. I think he just had his millionth customer wow. order from him on his site. And this never would have been possible when he started a few years ago. But the more successful he is, then the more people he's going to hire to be able to have his business grow. And that makes me happy because that's creating more jobs. Yeah, right? You're a by-proxy of the the million jobs. So do you think then with the the open accessibility of information that's out in the world, right? All of us have this like, uh, library of Alexandria in our hands. Mm -hmm. So we could literally dive into so many different topics, the mm -hmm. thousands or millions of different yeah. sectors and disciplines that exists out there. Yeah. This is why we're seeing so many entrepreneurs backing their own story because there's such a cross blend blend of things that exist, right? For like my own stories, like at an antique store and a ticket app worked in yeah. the nightclubs and now it's crypto. And it's like, it's such a unique combination of four or five different yeah. things and then you get it going. But then at some point you need to continue to scale. And for, for entrepreneurs like myself and those who are like just beginning, I've only been mm -hmm. doing this for now, maybe a little over a year and a half or so. Is there a point where you realize maybe you're at like your max capacity before you need to hire somebody um, from, from the people that you've worked with? Is there any sort of like common, I guess you could say like yeah. a glass ceiling that they, that's an entrepreneur reaches? Usually entrepreneurs, they wait too long because they want to do everything by themselves or they think they can't afford it. But I'd look at it this way. The minute your time is, say, worth more than $20 an hour, then it's time to delegate that stuff away. And that way you can, it's not because you're trying to save money. It's, and it's because you're trying to focus on the thing that you really need to focus on. And this other stuff is a distraction. So I would ask you, how much, if you were honest with yourself and everyone listening, if you're honest with yourself, how many hours a day do you do things that are repetitive that you really shouldn't have to do? Like repeating the same thing or a chore or cleaning your house or customer support or things that as an entrepreneur you can do, but it's not the highest and best use of your time. I've asked this question thousands of times. The answer is typically two to three hours. So if you could get back two to three hours a day would you be willing to pay $20 a day for that? And if the answer is not yes, then you have a problem with your business. <laughs> I mean, in other words, you don't have a business. So if you, if you have a business that's generating some kind of sales where you can afford $20 a day to have one person who works for you full time and they're available on Skype or Slack or whatever your favorite thing is and they work in the middle of the night in the Philippines, so it's daytime over here and they're available during their regular shift and you decide that's 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. or whatever it is, and they do that menu of repetitive tasks like order fulfillment or scheduling meetings or responding to customer inquiries or collecting feedback from customers or helping with your hiring process 
or you know, setting or sending out reports or like whatever it is that you have that's repetitive that you document, you record a little loom video saying, okay, this is how you do it. The more things you have in that little library of things that are repetitive that you can get off your shoulders, then that's when you need to hire a VA. And in the Philippines, do you know how much life-changing money is in, in the, the Philippines? I believe the average income is 3 to $5 a day, correct? Yeah. So I used to, before this COVID thing happened, I would fly to the Philippines twice a year. And I would take our teams out for a crazy meal. Can you, can you imagine going to the nicest restaurant in town and having 100 people and everyone's ordering all the nicest stuff and at the end of the meal... The waiter brings the bill to you and you have to pay that bill. What would, how would you feel, right? Let's say we did that here in Las Vegas. The nicest restaurant, invite 100 plus of your friends and it's all on you. All the drinks, everything, all on you. How would you feel about that? Uh, it feels rewarding. It feels, <laughs> it feels powerful a little bit, right? It feel like a sort of, a sort of success and responsibility yeah. that you're giving back to your community. But most people would feel, I don't think I could afford that. That's going to be out here in out, out here in Vegas, yeah. it's yeah, 100 $200 a person. You'd get crushed. Crushed, right? yeah. But when you're there in the Philippines and you have 100 people there and we're, eat, we're all eating the nicest stuff, it's you know five star, the whole deal, and it works out to three bucks a person, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Like you feel like a boss, right? Yeah. And all the people, they're so happy to see you because they think that you're some, you know, you're like the super successful guy from America. It costs you like a buck or two per meal just to eat like a regular meal. And you realize these folks are making three or four bucks an hour. One of my friends was the head of customer care at Walmart. So he had three pe 300 people on his team. And all they did was respond to complaints on Walmart. You can imagine, you know, on social media. And he once gave me crap and he said, Dennis, you are exploiting third world labor by hiring these people from the Philippines at three bucks an hour because you're taking away American jobs. And I said, bro, you are kidding me. Right? Yes, it's true that some of this video editing that we're doing is probably $50 an hour in the United States and we're getting it done for like three or $4. But do you think those people are, feel like they're being mistreated? This is not like China iPhone manufacturing at Fo Foxconn. So I made a post on Facebook and I had hundreds of people reply saying, I'm so glad to be working in Dennis's program. I used to have to commute two hours a day. I now have a great living for my family. And really if someone's making three or $4 an hour, that's middle class. That's pretty good over there. If they're making a thousand dollars a month, they're baller, right? They're living the high life. They can have a nice house. They can have um, waiters and servants and a driver and like all that kind of stuff. And I just love on the other side of the planet, how we're creating a ton of jobs over there and creating jobs for young adults over here who are managing those VAs. So generally our rule of thumb is three workers over there for one worker over here. So if we create 10 more jobs here in the US, that's another 30 jobs. We're, so I think of it as like the waiters, like our, mm -hmm. our American business owner entrepreneurs, they're good at relationships, they're good at talking to clients, they should be working on that, not in the kitchen, right? Waiters should be dealing with the clients. In the kitchen, you have people that are cooking vegetables and slicing things and you know washing mm -hmm. dishes. And we, we think that the virtual assistant should be focusing on that. And it creates a balanced ecosystem. I haven't seen that kind of division of labor, labor really be systematized yet. And that's what needs to happen. So for those who are listening, is there a website that you go to, to find a, a proper VA? Is it something that you just vet through Facebook oh, no, or no. On, on LinkedIn where no. you get bombarded constantly? With that's all go asking? That's garbage. You've got to go to onlinejobs.ph. That is the world's largest job site. There's over a million Filipinos on onlinejobs.ph created by my friend, John Jonas, who, I didn't know about him until after he'd already created this thing. And I figured it's some guy in the Philippines, you know, who speaks Tagalog, but it's actually this white guy who's as white as you can possibly imagine that started this website. He doesn't even go to the Philippines. He's got a whole team of Filipinos that are managing this whole thing. I went and visited him in Salt Lake City at his house, if you can even call it a house. The thing was monstrous. It had a whole motorcycle dirt track all the way around the outside and a whole garden, multiple levels. And at first I was starting to take some video and I said, holy moly, John, your house is incredible, right? You should be sharing some of this on social media. He's like, don't, don't post that on social media. You know why? Because you don't want the people who are making $3 an hour seeing that you live like that, right? I think, oh, okay, that makes sense. But yeah, onlinejobs.ph, we are creating a huge impact on the human race 
by creating jobs for, for things that are not worth your time at $3 an hour. Yeah. What is your time worth? It's not $3 an hour. It's way more than that. Yeah, that's what you pay. Like $3 an hour, barely get you a candy bar at 7-Eleven anymore. Are you familiar with the platform Axies Infinity? That's been kind of um, revolutionizing um, standard pay in the Philippines. Oh, what's that? It's a blockchain game. It's the first ever play to earn game. Huh. So basically it has the max amount of Discord members, 800,000. And there, I think believe there's about 2 million Filipinos playing and they're making, on average, playing this blockchain game, I think three, $3 an hour about. They're making about 20 to $30 a day oh, wow. playing this game. And so they're almost having like their own uh, capitalistic competitive job labor market happening between this blockchain game, which is a smart contract, and the payout here in America. So it's helping them a little bit. But even if it gets them up to you know $5 an hour, yeah. That's not much of a difference for for the American worker or the American CEO who's you know trying to turn over a big a big profit to pay these people a little bit more. Yeah, uh, it made me think think of that. But I'm gonna have to check that out because I'm also getting to that scaling point too, where yeah. I need to figure out what to do. Right now, I have UNLV interns. Um, shout out to my interns if, you, if you, who's uh, who's editing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been it's been a, a cool experiment because um, when I had my antique store, it was it was my family. I've had business partners. Yeah. I've never managed somebody under you, and that's a completely different responsibility and yeah. relationship. And it takes a little bit to kind of understand and channel it, and then you go level it up and up until you start turning a profit. Amazing, yeah. And that's the mark of being a business owner when you can delegate out and you feel that responsibility of someone else's livelihood is dependent upon you providing directions. Yeah. There, there was also another business that was, you, you kind of briefly touched on um, a little bit, um, and it's such a specific thing that you're a CTO of, Cairo Revenue, right? <laughs> a digital, essentially, it's digital marketing for chiropractors. chiropractors. Why such a specific niche? Is it just a, a market that you saw needed, um, needed some innovation, or do you have some sort of like tie to it personally? I believe the most valuable asset you have is your health and health is wealth. And the majority of our clients are doctors, which I think are really cool. And we have doctors of all different types. They could be dentists or functional medicine folks or chiropractors or sports medicine people or gastroenterologists or acupuncture people. But the idea of health is something that people have neglected the last couple of years. You know, aside from like whatever your belief is on masks and vaccines and things like that, people are not taking care of themselves. And in America, there's been this focus on pills and medicine, which is critical care. So healthcare is seen as well, you go to the hospital if you get a car accident or something like that. Okay, fine. So if you're about to die, the, med the, the American medical system is, is trying to keep you from dying, okay? But what about the other end? Yeah, preventative about, medicine. Yeah, yeah what, what about living healthy? What about working out? What about your mental health? What about all these other pieces? So I own a little piece of a lot of different agencies. And Cairo Revenue is one of our agencies. And chiropractors, I think, are one of the top medical verticals where they're open to other versions of, of health. And chiropractors used to be kind of like an 80s, 90s, like back office, like crack your back, $19 exam thing. And now we see them as the most willing to invest in technology, in marketing, in holistic kind of health, in supplements, in working out, and everything that's related to functional medicine, which is like combining East and West medicine. So... They're, because they're growing so fast, they're also hiring. So I'm, I want to look at which different verticals are hiring the fastest. Aside from chiropractors, I'd say there's real estate agents, right? Obviously, there's a huge real estate boom going on right now. Mm -hmm. So real estate agents are the ones who are selling houses or representing the buyers and sellers are doing super well. And so they have a huge marketing need. And we see that the agencies that are going, that are going to win, for anyone who's listening who is wanting to be a marketing specialist, social media consultant, you know, agency owner, you've got to focus on a particular niche. So serve just, so for chiro revenue, serving just chiropractors or for nifty thrifty dental serving just dentists. So Jake, I'd ask you if you're a dentist and you saw that there was this agency and all they did was serve dentists versus this other agency and they'll do like whatever. Cause you know, they're here in Las Vegas. Who would you go to? You want to go to the, the specialist, right? So everything is specializing. 
But the specialization, there's three ways to specialize. You specialize by geography. So like, oh, I'm a Las Vegas digital marketer or I'm a Phoenix or I'm like whatever city is. Or you specialize by the skill, like you do SEO or PPC or Twitter ads or like whatever it is. Or you specialize by the vertical, real estate, mortgage, home services. These first two are being competed down to zero. Why? Because if you're a skill-based marketer, like you use ClickFunnels or a particular tool, you have Upwork and Fiverr that are killing that whole market down. Then if you're a local specialization because you serve anyone in Las Vegas and your whole thing is Las Vegas digital marketing. Well, what's so different about Las Vegas digital marketing than San Diego digital marketing? Okay, maybe there's like casino stuff, but really all the people that are city specific, there's no difference in their digital marketing. So really the only way to have a premium if you're selling consulting of any type is serving a particular category, which means if you're serving chiropractors, then you have to know SEO and PPC and website design and click funnels and AI tools and video and you know Twitter. Like you have to know all these different things. So that's where the training comes in, where we want to train anyone who's focusing on that particular avatar, being customer focused on just real estate agents, like what we're doing with Tom Ferry, who's the top guy in real estate, has 400,000 real estate agents that follow him. How do we create all the kind of content so that Tom Ferry is the figurehead, can teach anyone in real estate using our training this is what you need to do as a real estate agent to be able to rank better in Google when people search for, you know, Orange County luxury homes or whatever the search is. Ge geographical specialization I could definitely see um, is kind of shying away with, especially in Las Vegas, I'll use them for example, because this is where we are. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of new home buyers are all remote workers mm -hmm. from, from California, Silicon Valley, Miami, Texas coming out here. Mm -hmm. And to them, it doesn't matter anything Vegas specific because they're just hanging out here. They're getting the tax benefits yeah. and they're mostly living in their home. And that's kind of what's happening to everybody with all of the delivery services and um, not even needing to, to leave. I was literally on Twitter spaces before you came. I'm with a bunch of crypto friends and they were talking about how they hadn't left their home in three days uh -oh. <laughs> because well, that's not good. Yeah. Because they, because they've just been so heads down in the computer and uh, as the world becomes globalized through the through the internet and maybe the manufacturing becomes localized because of COVID or whatever, um, you have to find a new way to specialize, um, which makes me presume that there might be a fourth type of specialization sometime here in the new future, maybe something digitally or VR um, that maybe just hasn't surfaced yet or maybe yeah. it's, and it's just um, its infancy stages. Could be, there's so many different ways to build relationships. Every time there's a new technology, every time there's a new network or anytime there's a new, call it like real estate, where another place that people can meet, there's going to be tools that's going to be integrated in an ecosystem and it creates more and more micro niches. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, me too, man. Um, and for a long time, I was very hesitant on um, the revolution or evolution of, of micro niches, but... I guess we're in a society now where all the land has been discovered, all of the, the tools in the physical world have been built, there's beds and chairs, and those aren't going to get, those aren't going to change the world, but maybe um, some ergonomic type chair is going to come and be the, the new standard chair, and then every chair is ergonomically um, specific, and that's kind of how everything's happening, especially with podcasting, and I use this oftentimes yeah. as an example. Joe Rogan is so popular because obviously he has a great command of, of his podcasting and um, conversational skills, but he was also one of the first few hundred podcasts. Yeah. So he kind of has like a macro podcast where he can literally reach out to anybody that he wants to and, and share, and share, um, and, and just share the, the stage with um, somebody who has some sort of confidence or people that are popular um, to a degree. But now, um, today's world, you have to be very specific with your podcasting and yep. you're not going to get nearly as many views and downloads as you would like. Maybe the percentage 10 years ago is, you know, maybe one in 10 podcasts make it, but now it's like one in 10,000 podcasts actually make it. So then you just have to continually practice what you're doing yep. until you're able to pivot it or direct it into the little crevice of a micro specialization that's out there. Yeah. But it's not too late to start a podcast. And I got a lot of friends and I just tell them, just say you have a podcast and then get them on Zoom or Skype or like whatever your thing is and just record it. You don't need the fancy video studio. You don't need all this gear. Like you can see Jake's got all this gear here. You don't need to have all that. You know what my favorite trick is to get people on a podcast, especially big names? 
What is that? It works almost every time. You say, I know so-and-so is very busy, so you're talking to the assistant, or you know, you send out an email, maybe it's cold. I guarantee you that we'll get 10,000 views of this podcast. And what we'll do is we only need 20 minutes of so-and-so's time. We get in and out. This is our process. And when we're done recording the podcast, we chop it up into different pieces. We put it on the blog. We put it on YouTube. We distribute it on these other channels. Excuse me. And then we run ads against it. So we are here providing free PR. And I've interviewed A-list celebrities using the technique of, hey, I guarantee you that our audience, you're, you're going to get at least 10,000 views from our audience because we're going to promote the thing. Most people, when they're podcasters, they're just checking boxes to get more and more people onto the podcast to say, I, you know, I've interviewed this many people. I've had this many episodes, which is great. But they don't spend time promoting their podcast which I think is a dishonor to the guest that mm -hmm. they have. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you, you know, these students, you guys are editing this. I would love to see you guys chop this up, turn it into blog post. Then I'm going to promote it, right? I've got a verified account on Twitter and on Facebook with whatever, a hundred thousand followers between the two. I'm not huge, but when you create content interviewing somebody, you're then leveraging their audience to be able to get more exposure. So it's not because you're trying to become Joe Rogan. It's because you want to be able to get yourself out there. And it also, your first, don't even try to go for A-list celebrities, your first 10 folks. Just get practice. Just learn how to talk. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I reached out to just my network for my first probably 50 before, yeah. before people start reaching out to you. And then you're like, oh, maybe I am doing something right. And just continue to accept because you never know who's really going to change your life on a podcast. Um, I've had some people that I thought were just going to be completely random conversations that actually just completely caught me off guard and ended up with even more leads and in and, yeah. and a podcasting term leads is just new guests. And then those, no, those guests turn into yep. bigger, bigger guests and then more business opportunities. And yep. then all of a sudden I'm sitting here with Dennis, you <laughs> right. And we get to hang out with folks like Jake Allen. Think about the networking that happens when you do a podcast. Yeah. Because then everyone else sees it and then they want to be in your podcast as well or mm. what have you. I, I was always a big believer that podcasting was just social leverage at the end of the day. Yeah. It, and it's also a profession that you could take with you um, wherever, wherever you want. You can go take your podcast to Seattle if you want to go see somebody or you could just open up a laptop and then just talk to somebody remotely. And I, it, it's like a life hack because I was facing the same situation with you where I was trying to reach out to these A-list people, all mm -hmm. these verified accounts. No one gives you the time. Everyone's busy, of course. But if you say, hey, you know, I have a podcast and um, I'm going to chop it up or I'm going to give it to just a specific Vegas market, then they're like, here's two hours of my time. It doesn't yep. matter. Like, yep. we just want to chat. And then um, even after the podcast off air, one of my favorite components is the conversation after, after your guest yeah. boundaries are lowered a little bit, then you can pitch your business idea or yep. you could just um, have a creative discussion on um, extending some of the conversation that maybe the, the guest doesn't feel comfortable saying on air. Yeah. So my buddy, Jan Koch, he runs the virtual summit mastery, which is how do you create podcasts at scale? Like interview 60 people and have a launch and drive sales off of it. And I've never done a virtual summit before. And I know this guy is super busy. His time is super valuable. If I were to even be able to, you know, get a couple hours of it. But instead I said, Hey, Jan, I'd love to have you on my podcast and ask you, how do you do virtual summits? And he went onto the podcast, we went an hour and a half, and I was just using that as, this is gonna sound like mean or whatever, but I used that time to pick his brain to answer every single question I had about how do you do that. A couple of weeks ago, I had Dr. Phil Ovadia on my podcast. He's one of the nation's top heart surgeons. He has a new book coming out next week called Stay Off My Operating Table. And I had all these questions about metabolic health and cholesterol and diet and whatnot. And we went for two hours of this doctor's time. Like this is the guy who does all the big heart surgeries, right? And I would never have been able to do that if it wasn't for having a podcast. And I merely just declared that I had a podcast, right? It was literally that simple. And if you guys don't have a podcast, you need to listen to what Jake is saying. It is, it is, a, it is a huge network authority game changer. It is social leverage for sure. And I'm I'm a big believer too that the audio influencer is going to overtake the video influencer here in the mm -hmm. next decade as um, AirPods um, become more scalable. The price comes down. Everyone's walking around society with AirPods, consuming mm -hmm. audio content, and everybody's becoming a micro specialist in all their degrees. You don't have enough time to sit and watch these YouTube videos or these movies, but you do have time to sit and walk and um, you know do do your laundry and listen to a podcast, yep. commute to work, and listen to somebody. 
Yeah. Um, so it's just going to be an ever growing utility, especially now with the the rise of Twitter spaces and yeah. Clubhouse. That's just kind of an extension of your own brand. It's like a micro podcast um, per se, and also improves your conversational skills mm -hmm. and you feel more confident when you're approaching somebody um, who is just a little bit farther down their successful path than you are. Mm -hmm. And um, we're all human. Sometimes we come get frightened, even though at the end of the day, we're all just, we're all just human. Um, so it's just overcoming your own uh, obstacles that are just some sort of uh, mental gymnastics. Yeah. It but, sharpens your focus being on a podcast because you have to re-examine yourself and say, what do I stand for? When someone's introducing you or you're introducing them, you have to be able to frame it from their point of view and yours. Do you ever look back at like your first ever... Um, podcast episodes or the first ever video content that you ever posted and kind of cringe, but then be happy to see the journey that you, that you've come across, um, which also leads me yeah. to just another question was, uh, do you remember whenever you put out your first ever content on the internet? It was just over 20 years ago. I, I gave the closing keynote address at a conference with over 2000 people there. And I was terrible at public speaking. I'm not even all that great right now. I don't say ums and ahs. I learned that from Toastmasters. And I remember the thrill where they announced you. Have you walked out onto a big stage? The largest audience that I've ever spoken to publicly was probably about 300, maybe three, 400. It was in college. So when you have audiences that are over a thousand and it's on a big stage, it takes a long time to walk all the way to the middle of the stage. So I remember walking up the stairs, walking across the stage. There's this huge screen that's like 50 feet tall and 200 feet across with my face on it. There's the walk up music. That felt kind of cool. I walked up to the front of the stage, just like we had when we were at the, was it the Caesars Palace? Mandalay Bay. Mandalay Bay. And I walked up to the front and I looked across the sea of faces because it's all dark, but, but you know, there's like a couple thousand people in the audience. And I thought, Holy crap, I forgot what I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I paused there for five or 10 seconds, just looking across the audience. Because at first I was like, wow, this is really cool. There's all these people and I'm scared to death. Oh, shoot. What was I going to say? What? Oh, I don't even remember what the slides were. And I had to look back and see like what the slides were. And then I ended up giving a good presentation. But at the end, I had all these people. I had a, I had a standing ovation. And all these people came up to me and said, Dennis, that was an incredible keynote. Wow, the whole vision. And this is when... I was, I ran the digital marketing for American Airlines and I talked about the future of interactive marketing where all the data would be connected, whether it's at the gate or online or in the mail, or, you know, you call, like we have all your information in one place, remember your preferences. I talked about what systems would be necessary to be able to personalize every single touch point. And they said, Dennis, you had such command, especially in the very beginning when you walked out on the stage. And what actually happened was I forgot what I was going to say. And they thought this was like, me like having supreme confidence and being able to just have quiet and look across the audience. I thought that was so funny, but I was a terrible speaker because I was just saying whatever I was saying. And now what I've learned, I'm not saying I'm a pro now, but now what I've learned is I don't even have slides. I was just telling you when we came from the elevator that I gave five presentations today and none of them required slides because I have a few key bullet points, and then what I'll do is I'll take Q&A for the audience, or I'll demonstrate how to do something live. I, so I shown today, live, how do I use these different tools to be able to deep fake my voice on a podcast that never happened, using a face that never actually said those words, right? And I demonstrated it, and I thought that's way more powerful than slides because I'm actually demonstrating something. So now, on all the, I've probably given 750, 800 stage kinds of speeches, I don't use slides anymore, I just log into something and demonstrate live how to do something. I'll call out from the audience. I'll say, hey, somebody name a city anywhere in the world. So like name a city. Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv. So I can pull up Tel Aviv on Google Photos and we're on Facebook and you can see all the photos that I've ever had in Tel Aviv. So I have pictures and videos of me with the executives at Fiverr because Fiverr is an Israeli company, right? And Wix. Wix is also an Israeli company and going to the Western Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, right, which is not too far from Tel Aviv, and being on the beaches in Tel Aviv, and, you know, Tel Aviv this and Tel Aviv that. And I'll say, what, and I'll, now give me a topic related to Tel Aviv, or it doesn't even have to be related to Tel Aviv. You just say Judaism. Judaism. So then I would go into Jarvis and I'd say, what, is the, what do, we, what do uh, Westerners need to know about Judaism, right? And I'll write a whole blog post and I'll post it live. It'll take me two minutes to do. 
I'll demonstrate exactly how I do it. And it's like a magic trick where you're wowing the audience because there's no way I could have anticipated you would have said Judaism in Tel Aviv. You could have said, what's the best pizza on the Upper East Side, right? And I'd have to write an article based on that or create a video or give a speech on it or pull up a friend. And now in these interactive virtual presentations, because I, I don't think that presentations should just be one-way monologuing. YouTube is for stuff like that. We're just watching people talk. I believe they need to be interactive, just like the stuff with Brad Lee, where it's Choose Your Own Adventure or the Jake Paul Choose Your Own Adventure stuff. So I'm always thinking like, how do we make this stuff interactive? And that's what I think, that's what I think the next level, the, the, the next stage of presentations and entertainment is going to be is a lot of interactive stuff. And that, that model that you just explained is exactly what you did at Mandalay Bay. <laughs> and this is what I said right at the beginning of this conversation. So we've come very much full circle. Um, and so as we end this, I have one final question, the yep. same question that I ask to all of the guests that talk here live in Las Vegas. What does Las Vegas mean to you? Las Vegas is about connecting. It's always about the people. It's not the city. It's not the buildings. It's not the casinos. But people who come to Las Vegas, they come with a certain level of optimism. Because, you know, people say, yeah, Vegas, baby. You know, you're going to Vegas for the weekend. You never hear people say, oh, I'm going to Las Vegas this week. It's awesome. So the energy's high. SEMA was just here a couple days ago. Same thing with Affiliate Summit. And then PubCon was on Friday. I got to meet people from three conferences without having to go anywhere because I live here. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it's a beautiful place. It's it the, the best way to explain it is if you ever fly into Vegas, what does everyone do right when the wheels of the plane hit the track? Oh, yes. Everyone's cheering. Oh, yeah. Ooh, and that does not happen in any other city in the world. Not when they're leaving Vegas. It's different. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everyone's sleeping and hungover. <laughs> Miserable prize and showered in two days. <laughs> Dennis, where do I send everybody um, who wants to learn more about you, any of the businesses that you're related to, or any other links that you'd like to mention? You guys want to learn more about me? Go to themasterpresentation.com. That is our Bible of all the training that we, you know, or the Torah or whatever you want to, whatever your book is, this this is like our Netflix of all digital marketing training. And everything that I know, I've put there at the master presentation. And of course it's for sale because it supports all of the people that are working on this kind of stuff. But if you are in a situation where you're not able to afford it or whatever, let me know and I'll give you access. Wow. Couldn't have put that any but better. You have to, to, to get access. There's a string on it. You have to make a one minute video talking about Jake or me or this particular podcast. And you want to send it to Stephanie at blitzmetrics.com. And the subject line is I love Jake Gallen. Wow. Perfect. So all right. I do that. Do it, everyone. Put put in some good rep from for me and for Dennis, because you know he's going to channel it and make sure that ten thousand people or it goes to ten thousand views, as he mentioned before. This conversation turned out much better than anticipated. You're you're a wonder, and I'm so glad that you live out here in Las Vegas, um, that you can help push all of the entrepreneurs that are budding up right now and um, make us much better than just a, a hyper-specialized person who exists in this geographical location and disperse us to the international world. So Thank, thank you, Jake. An thank, honor. Thank you, friend. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll catch you next time.